Good afternoon. Um, this is part two of CFW Walther's The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel. Um, you can get this for $13, 450 page book, for $13 at cost on Amazon. Um, it's published by Justin Sinner Publications, uh, Dr. Pastor Jordan Cooper, who also has a great channel um, on YouTube, Introduction to Lutheranism and Conference Speaking in, in many, many videos. But he puts this out at, at cost, $13 at Amazon, or you can check him out um, at justinsinner.com. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is putting um, in the explanation a online copy, an older uh, version that you can read as well to follow along. Yesterday we called uh, we, co we covered the preface and introduction. Today is first evening lecture, September 12th, 1884. My dear friends, if you are to become efficient teachers in our churches and schools, it is a matter of indispensable necessity that you have a most minute knowledge of all doctrines of the Christian revelation. However, having achieved such knowledge, you have not yet attained all that is needed. What you needed over above your knowledge of the doctrines is that you know how to apply them correctly. You must not only have an act Appre apprehension of the doctrines in your intellect, but all of them must have entered deeply into your heart, and there manifested their divine and heavenly power. All these doctrines must have become so precious, so valuable, so dear to you, that you cannot but profess with a glowing heart, in the words of Paul. We believe, therefore, we have spoken. And in the words of all the apostles, we cannot but speak the things which we have heard. You, uh, you have indeed not seen the things which your physical eyes or heard them with your physical ears like the apostles, but you ought to have an experience with them, with your spiritual eyes and ears. While in my dogmatic lectures I aim to ground you in every doctrine that, um, uh, and make you certain of it, I have designed these evening lectures on Fridays for making you practical theologians. I wish to talk the Christian doctrine into your hearts, enabling you in your future calling to come forward as living witnesses with a demonstration of the spirit and of power. I do not want you to stand in the pulpits like lifeless statues but to speak with confidence and with cheerful courage, offer, uh, offer help where help is needed. This is very important. Watch this. Now, all of the doctrines, the foremost and most important is the doctrine of justification. However, immediately following upon it, as the second in importance, is how law and gospel are to be divided. It's crucial. The distinction between law and gospel shall now claim our attention and form the subject of our earnest study. True, Luther says that he is, he is willing to place him who is well versed in the art of dividing law from the gospel at the head of all and call him the Doctor of Holy Writ, Ph.D. in Theology. But I would not have you believe that I intend to place myself ahead of everyone else and be regarded as a Doctor of Sacred Scriptures. That would be a great mistake. I admit that people sometimes call me a Doctor of Theology, but for myself, I rather wish to remain a humble, remain a humble disciple and sit at the feet of her Doctor Luther to learn this doctrine from him, even as he learned it from the apostles and prophets. As often as you attend these lectures, I want you to come breathing a silent prayer in your hearts that God may grant us his Holy Spirit abundantly, you to the end that you may 
profitably hear me uh, to the end that I may that I may teach effectively let us then take up our task with firm confidence that God will bless both our own souls and the souls of those who we are to rescue comparing Holy Scripture with other writings we observe that no book is apparently so full of contradictions as the Bible and that not only in minor points but in principal matter in the doctrine how we may come to God and be saved in one in one place the Bible offers forgiveness to all sinners in another place forgiveness of sins is withheld from sinners in one passage a free offer of of everlasting of life everlasting is made to all men in another men are directed to do something themselves to be saved this riddle is solved when we reflect that there there in scriptures two entirely different doctrines the doctrine of the law and doctrine of the gospel thesis one the doctrinal contents of the entire holy scriptures both the old and new testament are made up of two doctrines differing, differing fundamentally from each other the law and the gospel it is not my intention to give a systematic treatment of the doctrine of the law and gospel in these lectures my aim is rather to show you how easy it is to work a great damage upon your hearers by confounding law and gospel in spite of their fundamental differences and thus to frustrate the aim of both doctrines you will not begin to be interested in this point until you place before yourselves in clear outlines the points in which the law and gospel differ the point of difference between law and the gospel is not this that the gospel is a divine and a law law a human doctrine resting on the reason of man not at all whatever of either doctrine is contained in the scriptures is the word of the living god himself nor is there difference that only gospel is necessary not the law as if the latter were mere addition that could be dispensed uh, within a straight no both are equally nece necessary without law the gospel is not understood without gospel the law benefits us nothing nor can this naive yet uh, quite current distinction be admitted that the law is the teaching of the old while the gospel is the teaching of the new testament by no means there are gospel contents in the old and law contain contents in the new testament moreover in the new testament the lord has broken the seal of the law by purging it from jewish ordinance <coughs> excuse me nor do the law and gospel differ as regards their final aim as through the gospel aimed at men's salvation the law at men's condemnation no both have their final aim man's salvation only the law ever since the fall cannot lead us to salvation it can only prepare us for the gospel furthermore it is through the gospel that we uh, obtain the ability to fulfill the law to a certain extent nor can we establish a difference by cl uh, claiming that the law and the gospel contradict each other there is no contradictions in scripture each is distinct from the other but both are in the most perfect harmony with one another finally the difference is not this that only one of these doctrines is meant for christians even for the christian the law still retains its significance indeed when a person ceases ceases to employ either of these two doctrines he is no longer a true christian the true points of difference between the law and the gospel are the following number one these doctrines differ as regards 
the manner of their being revealed to man. 2. As regards their contents. 3. As regards the promises held out by either doctrine. 4. As regards their threatening. As 5. As regar regards the function and effect of either doctrine. 6. As regards the persons to whom either the one or the other doctrine must be preached. All other differences can be grouped under one of these six headings. Now let us have the scripture proof for what I have said. In the first place, then, law and gospel differ as regards the manner of their being revealed to man. Man was created with the law written in his heart. True in consequence of the fall, this script in the heart has become quite dulled, but it is not all not utterly wiped out. The law may be preached to the most ungodly person and his conscience will tell him. That is true, but when the gospel is preached to him, his conscience does not tell him the same. The preaching of the gospel rather makes him angry. The worst slave or vice admits that he ought to do what is written in the law. Why is this? Because the law is written in his heart. The situation is different when the gospel is preached. The gospel reveals and proclaims nothing but free acts of divine grace. And these are not at all self-evident. What God has done according to the gospel, he is, not, he is not obliged to do. As though he could not possibly have remained a just and loving God if he had not done it. God would still have been eternal love if he had allowed all men to go to perdition. Romans 2, 14-15, we read, When the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these not having the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts uh, the mean while accusing or excusing one another. Here we have the apostles' testimony that even the blind pagans hear the bear, sorry, the moral law, with them in their heart and conscience. No supernatural revelation was needed to inform them concerning the moral law. The Ten Commandments were published only for the purpose of bringing out in bold outline the dulled script of the original law written in men's hearts. On the other hand, we have from the same epistle and in the uh, from the same apostle and in the same epistle this statement concerning the gospel. Romans sixteen, twenty five through twenty six, to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, in the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept since the beginning of the world, but now is made manifest by the scriptures, by the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. In clear terms, the apostle here testifies that it was impossible since the beginning of the world to discover the gospel. It is because it became known only through an act of the Holy Spirit, who inspired men to write its message. Try and realize the important distinction. All religions contain portions of law. Some of the heathen, by their knowledge of the law, have advanced so far that they have perceived the necessity of an inner cleansing of the soul, a purification of thoughts and desires, but of the gospel, not a particle is found anywhere except in the Christian religion. Had the law not been written in men's hearts, no one could, no one would listen to the preaching of the law. Everyone would turn away from it and say, that is too cruel, nobody can keep commandments such as these. But my friends, do not hesitate to preach the law. People may revile it, yet they do so only with their mouths. What you say when, you, when preaching the law to people is something that their own conscience 
conscience is preaching to them every day. Nor could we convert any person by preaching the gospel to him unless we preach the law to him first. It would be impossible to convert anyone if the law has not been written in man, men's hearts. Of course, God could, could save all men by a mere act of his will, but he has not, re, has not revealed to us that he intends to do so. And the definite order of salvation which he has appointed for us does not indicate any intention of this kind. The second point of difference between law and the gospel is shown by the contents of either. The law, this is important, the law tells us what we are to do. No such instruction is contained in the gospel. On the contrary, the gospel reveals to us only what God is doing. The law is speaking concerning our works, the gospel concerning the great works of God. In the law we hear the tenfold summons, thou shalt. Beyond that, the law has nothing to, to say to us. The gospel, on the other hand, makes no demands whatever. But does not the gospel demand faith? Yes, that, however, is just the same kind of command as when you say to a hungry person, come sit down at my table and eat. The hungry person will not reply, Bosh, I will not take orders from you. No, he will understand and accept your words as a kind invitation. That is what the gospel is, a kind invitation to partake of heavenly blessings. Galatians 3, verse 12, we read, The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. This is an exceedingly important passage. The law has nothing to, to say about forgiveness, about grace. The law does not say if you are contrite, if you begin to make amends, the remainder of your trespasses will be forgiven. This is important. Check this out. Not a word of this is found in the law. The law issues only commands and demands. The gospel, on the other hand, only makes offers. It means not to take anything but only to give. Only to give. Accordingly, we read in John 1.17, The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What a mom momentous statement this is. The gospel contains nothing but grace and truth. When reading the law, pondering it, and measuring our conduct against its teachings, we are terrified by the multitude of demands which it makes upon us. If nothing else, we're, we're, uh, nothing else were told us, we should be hurled into despair. But we should be lost. God be praised. There is still another doctrine gospel. To that we cling. Now, this is a good section as well. Uh, law and gospel differ in the third place by reason of their promises. What the law promises is, is just as great as a boon as what the gospel promises, namely everlasting life and salvation. But at this point, we must, or we point, or, blah, yeah. But at this point, these trifocals aren't helping. But at, at this point, we're confronted with a mighty difference. All promises of the, of the law are made on certain conditions, namely on the condition that we fulfill the law perfectly. Accordingly, the promises of the law are, are, are more disheartening. The greater they are, the law offers us food, but does not hand it down to us where we can reach it. It often, it often, uh, oh sorry, it offers us salvation in about the same manner as refreshments were offered to uh, Tantalus in the hell of the pagan Greeks. It's, uh, it says to us indeed, I will quench the thirst of your soul and appease your, your hunger. But it is not able to accomplish this because it, is, it always adds, All this you shall have if you do what I command. Let me see here. Over and against, the note, against this note, the lovely, sweet, and comforting language of the gospel. 
It promises us the grace of God and salvation without any condition whatsoever. It is a promise of free grace. It asks nothing of us but take what I give and you have it. This is not a condition but a kind invitation. invitation. Through Moses, God says, Leviticus 8, 18, 5, You shall keep my statutes, my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. This means that, that only the person who keeps the law and no one else shall be saved by the law. Luke 10, 26 and following, Christ meets the question of the self-righteous scribe with the counter-question, what is written in the law? How readest thou? The scribe answers correctly, Thou shalt love the, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy, all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And now Christ says to him, This do, and thou shalt live. The Lord on this occasion testified that if salvation is to come by way of law, Only he who fulfills the law can obtain it. By the way, we are not to think that to those who do the will of God, salvation must come as a reward of their merit. By no means, their salvation too would be owing to the goodness of God. But to return to our discussion, uh, the, after, uh, the aforementioned condition which is attached to the law hurls us into despair. On a certain occasion, when the Lord wished to instruct the disciples as to what they must preach, he says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth is, and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 15 through 16. This shows us no condition whatever is attached to the gospel. It is the promise of grace. Furthermore, we read Romans 3, 22 through 24. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And again, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Unconditional promises of grace and salvation, that is what we find in the gospel. Verily, a precious difference when law has laid us low, we, are cheerf we can cheerfully raise our heads again because besides the law, we have another doctrine which proposes to us no demands of any kind. Here's a, here's a, a good part here, a uh, good quote here. We are to ask Christ, what is expected of me in order that I, might, that I may be saved? He would answer, no works. I have done all the works that had to be done. You need not drink one drop of the cup that I had to drink. That's the cup of God's wrath. Beautiful, beautiful. A person entering fully into the meaning of this fact must be moved to leap forever for very for very joy that these glad tidings have been brought to him. A person who, in spite of this message continues to be despondent and muses, I'm an abominable man, there is no forgiveness for me, does nothing less than reject the gospel, reject Christ. Though I have committed the, the grossest sins, and had to say with Paul, I am the chief of sinners. Though I have committed the sin of Judas, or the sin of Cain, nevertheless I am not to accept the gospel, because it demands nothing of us. The fourth difference between law and the gospel relates to threats. The gospel contains no threats at all, only words of consolation. Wherever in scripture you come across a threat, you may be assured that this passage belongs in law. This is important. I'm going to read this again. The fourth difference between law and the gospel relates to threats. The gospel contains no threats at all, but only words of consolation. Wherever in, script, wherever in Scripture you come across a threat, you may be assured that that passage belongs to the law. He would indeed be a blessed person who could fully realize this comforting truth. 
The Holy Spirit produces the knowledge wherever it exists. exists. Without the Holy Ghost, this knowledge cannot be attained. Every person re remains an unbeliever unless the Holy Ghost works this knowledge in him. However, we are not to imagine that the gospel makes men secure because it has no threats to hurl at him. On the contrary, the gospel removes from believers the, the desire to sin. The law, on the other hand, is nothing but threats. As Abraham sent Hagar away into the desert with a loaf of bread and a jug of water, so the law hands out us a piece of bread and then threat and thrusts us into a desert. Deuteronomy 27:26. God says through Moses, Curse it be he that confirmeth not all the words of the law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Indeed, man is invited by the law to pronounce a curse upon himself. Only a person engulfed by infernal darkness can believe that the law will give him no trouble. The gospel proceeds in an entirely different fashion. Paul says, for, uh, 1 Timothy 1.15, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Hence, even the foremost among sinners is not made to hear threats, but only the sweetest promise. Luke 4, 16-21, we have the record. He, Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to uh, heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all of them were, that were in the synagogue were fa fastened on him. And he began to say to them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. On this occasion the Lord announced the contents of his doctrine, or of the gospel. He meant to say, I am not come to bring a new law. I have not come to bring a new law. I proclaim the gospel. Happy the man who realizes this fact. May God help us all to attain this knowledge. That is the first evening lecture. And I will put the link uh, in the bottom uh, that you can follow along. Uh, it's uh, an, older, uh, an older version of the book. But as I said, you can get that for $13 um, at cost on Amazon. Um, and also I'm going to put the link uh, uh, um, from my blog um, that I just started up, Justified and Sinner, uh, blogspot.com. It's dedicated to the proclamation of the gospel and the study of soteriology, the study of salvation from a Lutheran Reformation perspective. God bless, guys.